Okay, if it's, I mean, I cannot see any of you, so if it gets, if it stops at any point in time or there are issues, please voice it, voice, voice it out. Okay, so the topic of my research, in a sense, is investigating the mechanisms underlying computations in neural circuits. So the brain, if you think about it, is the most complex structure known to man. Its complexity is so daunting that Sir Francis Crick likened it to a piece of alien technology. Nevertheless, given how much neurological disorders are prevalent in today's world, understanding this piece of alien technology is the need of our times. My work aims to understand how the brain functions by looking at the underlying circuits that make the computations or in the end make the brain work. In particular, I'm interested in understanding how different circuits in the brain extract different information or perform computations. So I'll begin with an idea of how we think the brain uh, decomposes information and give you an overview of what role we think circuits play in this part. Oops, okay. So to understand that, I'll start with this visual scene, uh, a chaotic visual scene, which many of you must be familiar with, uh, traffic in India. So if you look at this chaotic scene, if you're a driver, you have to be cognizant of many kinds of stimuli. One, you have these people, pedestrians, who are crossing the road exactly at the point where they're not supposed to, likely also at the time when they're not supposed to. You also have these big buses which are moving slowly around you. And then you have these motorbikes, small vehicles which are zipping by, trying to reach their destination quickly. Now, given these variety of stimuli, how does a driver, somebody who's navigating this traffic, how, does, how do they navigate it successfully without causing accidents? And indeed, millions of people do this every day. So how does the brain parse this information? The way we think the brain does it is by decomposing the information into many streams. So if you take a visual image, what the brains, what the, say, the visual system sees, what we think the system does is it breaks it down into different channels. For example, one channel may just respond to activity or changes of light. For example, when the light increases, then that particular channel will respond. There may be channels which respond only when the light levels go down in the scene. So wherever in the field you see points where the light levels go down, those would be the points which would respond. There could be uh, channels which look at really fine, stim fine uh, objects. For example, if you look at the grass here, that's of a really fine structure. Unlike the bird, which is more broader and more, you could call it as a bigger structure. There are also structures, now this is what I'm talking, I'm, I'm showing you a static image here. But of course, in real life images, you're not looking at static images, you're looking at motion. So there are circuits which we think extract movement in say specific directions. Some circuits may respond to say elongated objects compared to a circular object. So this is how we think. So we think the information that hits the system is decomposed into different channels. And each channel does its own job of extracting information that it's supposed to do, okay? And so this impressive, or this is called as parallel processing. And this ability can be seen right at the first stage of visual processing in the retina. So if you look at the eye, the front of the eye, which is the transparent portion, is the cornea. 
and so which allows the light to so whatever light you see here hits the enters the eye through the cornea and then you have a lens which focuses the eye focuses the light onto the back of the eye and lining the back of the eye is a thin layer of tissue called the retina if you look at the retina per se it's about 0.5 millimeters thick that's like putting five pieces of paper together and that's the thickness of the retina and if you look at its overall size it's about a thousand square millimeter so it's really not a big piece of tissue but packed in this small structure is about a hundred million cells and if you look, take a closer look at the structure so what i'm showing you here is a cross section so this is a cross section of the eye and what i'm showing you here is a cross section of the small section of the region of the eye and you can see these nice neurons in it which has a very layered structure and this is a, a much nicer image uh, of the retina cross section of the retina from uh, the national eye institute by Wei Li. so what i'm showing you here so if you can see there are layers of cells so there's one layer here and there's another layer of cells here and then there's a third layer of cells here so the blue here shows the somas of these of the neurons okay so the first layer consists of photoreceptors and so when light falls on these photoreceptors what they do is they transduce the photons into electrical signals and these signals are sent to the next layer which is populated by bipolar cells and these bipolar cells after receiving the information from the photoreceptors transmit the information downstream to the ganglion cells which are in the third layer and the ganglion cells sends the information to higher centers in the brain through this optic nerve for higher processing so if you think about a circuit in the retina you need a photoreceptor because that's the only cell that converts the photons into electrical signals then to connect the photoreceptors to the ganglion cells you need a bipolar um, sir cell. sorry sorry to interrupt i think someone has a doubt uh, oh sorry okay please go ahead uh, just a small speaking. doubt is motion processing done in the retina itself i thought mm -hmm. it was done in the ventral system i mean at least father so, leaf further so there are circuits in the retina at least in say in lower order mammals which do motion processing okay. right in the retina uh, okay. we do not know if this is if this is happening in mammals uh, or humans for that matter but there is increasing evidence that it is possible but the bottom line is perhaps the most studied motion processing uh, circuit is in the retina in the rodent retina okay thank you okay. yeah okay so i was telling you that if you think of any circuit in the eye you need a photoreceptor you need a bipolar cell and a ganglion cell so that's the minimum circuit to send information to the brain there are also neurons called amacrine cells and horizontal cells which modulate the activity uh, at the level of the bipolar cell or the ganglion cell. Now I've given you there are five types of neurons. But if you look at closely at each type, each type can be divided into multiple subtypes. There are three to four kinds of photoreceptors, two kinds of these horizontal cells, 12 to 14 kinds of bipolar cells, 60 types of amacrine cells, and 50 types of ganglion cells. In total, as on date, we think there are about 130 types of neurons in the mouse retina, which is the best studied uh, model. At the level of the macaque or humans, we think at, at this point, we think there may be a 50, 50 to 60 types, but that's likely because we have not studied them in detail. So this is the best model we have. And so, I'm going to give you the overviews from this. So the idea here is that each ganglion cell will connect to specific bipolar cells and amacrine cells to eventually extract the information that it wants. Okay. So this is sort of like uh, building blocks. 
a game which many of us must have played as kids. So what we have is a series of blocks, specific or different blocks. And in this case, we have 150 kinds of blocks. And using these blocks, we can construct different kinds of circuits. And so as I pointed out, a basic circuit would have a photoreceptor, a bipolar cell, and a ganglion cell. And there, there are likely to be amacrine cells too in a circuit. Now note that although amacrine cells are connected to the ganglion cell, they're also connected to the bipolar cell and the photoreceptor. So any neuron below the level of the bipolar cell requires a bipolar cell and a photoreceptor to be connected. Okay, so that's an important distinction. So the ganglion cell receives input from bipolar cell and an amacrine cell, but the amacrine cell itself receives input from a bipolar cell. Okay, we'll get to that, why that's important, we'll get to that at a later point. So if you can differentiate or if you can think of replacing this ganglion cell with one of the other 50, replacing this bipolar cell with one of the other 14, then in the end, if you have a combination, you will get a different circuit. Okay, so now what is the difficulty in understanding or studying these circuits? First of all, I said there are about 100 million neurons in the retina, and I'm saying that there are these specific circuits in a mesh of these neurons. And our job is to be able to study one such neuron in this mesh. This is perhaps best illustrated by this video I'm going to show you. So this is a video taken from, so, okay, before I play it, I guess I should give you, ah. So this is a video, this is a simulation of a neural network in the juvenile rat somatosensory cortex. So this particular uh, simulation has about 31,000 neurons and 200 types of neurons. So, oh, oh sorry. See my not get, okay. Okay, so now a blue neuron indicates there's very less activity, whereas white or red and yellow indicates a lot of activity. Now we started with one neuron, but if you actually look at the whole circuit, you can see there's a huge number of neurons as it zooms out. And you can see some neurons are getting activated at some times and different other neurons at different times. And there are cases where, say, a large population of the neurons are getting activated together, like at that point. Now, given this whole mesh, how do you study the activity of, say, one neuron in this, in this mesh to understand what are the neurons it's connected to. So the way we do it is by patch clamp recordings, single cell patch clamp recordings. So the technique basically is that you use a glass pipette, a thin glass pipette, which is so small that you can, it is smaller than the size of a neuron's cell body. And you have a glass, you have an electrode, an electrical an electrode, an electrical wire that goes into this uh, glass. Now, when you reach, when you, okay, let me put the pointer again. Okay, so that's what this is, a glass electrode, and you have a wire inside this. And since glass is highly resistant, even though there are cells, once you put this inside the tissue, even though there are cells around it, the signals coming from those cells will not reach the electrode. What will reach the electrode is what's under the tip. And what we do is we put the electrode on one neuron so that we look at the activity of just that one neuron in this whole mesh. And the actual structure looks like this. This is the wire through which you put the glass electrode. And that is a typical chamber in which you put your tissue, which you're going to study. So how do you do retinal uh, patch clamping as this technique is called. So what we do is we extract the retina, we isolate the retina from the eye cup, put it flat. So remember I showed you a cross section of the retina. Now what that means is, so this would be a cross section here that's cut. Now in reality what that means is that if you look at this whole retina, 
it's sort of made of layers, like a sandwich. The top layer consists, one layer con will consist of ganglion cells, one layer of the bipolar cells, and one layer of the uh, photoreceptors. And when you do a cross section, you can see all of them neatly arranged, okay? So then what we do, we isolate the retina and then we put it under a microscope as I just showed you, and then we view it under higher magnification. And when we view it, this is how it looks like. What you're looking at is neurons on the ganglion cell layer. And what you're seeing here is the actual glass pipette. And as you can see, the neuron is about 10 microns. Uh, the soma is about 10 microns in diameter and the electrode is less than a micron sometimes uh, to patch on to an individual neuron here. And once you do that, once you attach onto the membrane of that neuron, what you can see is depending on the stimulus you give, you can look at the activity of this neuron, which is in this case uh, spiking, the extracellular spike activity. Okay, I, I'll just show you a video of how this process actually looks when you're patching on to a ganglion cell. Okay, so this is a video taken by uh, people I know uh, the, in Switzerland. So what you're seeing here, so this is actually a blood vessel, what you just saw there. And so this is the layer of the ganglion cells. And what they're doing is cleaning it. And now you can see these circular structures here. Those are all uh, ganglion cells. These are uh, red blood cells that are moving along this uh, blood vessel. And so this person is actually cleaning the area so that they can patch on to the ganglion cell. And as I was saying, this is about 10 microns in size. And you can imagine that's like about a micron in diameter. And as he closes in on the neuron, you saw it was making a dimple and now he's patched on. So now, okay, I don't know what happened there. Okay, so now if you do that, what kind of responses do you see at the level of the ganglion cell? So for a simple stimulus, say for example, like flashing a light that is shown here, so the way this uh, trace, whatever I'm showing here, the image I'm showing here is, at this point, there is no light uh, turned on. And when this blip happens, that's when the light is turned on and it stays on and then it is turned off, okay? And what I'm showing you here is the response of a ganglion cell to this particular stimulus. And you can see that this ganglion cell, there's an increase in spike activity, spiking these blips here are spikes, and that's the currency with, with which neurons signal to each other. And you can see there's a lot of activity as soon as you turn on the light, but there's nothing when you turn off the light. So this is an on cell. It responds only when you turn on the light. And what you see here is an off cell. There's no response when you turn on the light, but there's a lot of activity when you turn off the light, which is the exact opposite of this one. What you're seeing here is an on-off cell where it responds when you turn on the light and when you turn off the light. And this is because they receive, these two ganglion cells receive different presynaptic inputs. That is, they receive inputs from different bipolar cells and democrine cells, okay? So now this difference you can make out for a simple stimulus, like if you turn on the light or turn it off. Now, depending on, and you can come up with a variety of stimuli and you can show that different neurons respond differently. And by using such variety in stimuli, the latest count says there are 50 types of ganglion cells, each with its unique response pattern and each with its unique presynaptic circuitry, set of bipolar cells and amacrine cells, okay? So again, let's recap what a circuit looks like. So you have photoreceptors, bipolar cells, ganglion cells, and amacrine cells. And as I pointed out, if you change these bipolar cells or amacrine cells, eventually you get a different uh, composition or a different computation performed at the level of the ganglion cell. Okay, is that clear? Okay, so the next step I'm gonna to take to you, so I'm gonna to talk to you about one circuit in the retina, that is the circuit that detects motion. 
So what is a so this is this feature is called direction selectivity. So what is direction selectivity? If I were to record from a direction selective ganglion cell, and if I move a bar of light, say in one direction, say its preferred direction, it would respond maximally to that motion. Now, if you take the same bar of light, I'm not changing the properties of the bar except for the fact that now I'm moving it in the opposite direction. Now, this neuron responds minimally to this direction and we call it the null direction. So this ability to respond maximally to certain directions called the preferred and minimally to the null is called direction selectivity. And this happens because of receiving its inputs from a specific kind of amacrine cell and bipolar cell. The amacrine cell is called the starburst amacrine cell, just so you know, uh, okay? And so it's long been thought that this computation occurs by, requires two kinds of neurons, the bipolar cells, which feed to the ganglion cells, and the starburst amacrine cell. Okay, so it's thought that you need two kinds of neurons. However, this has been difficult to test. And why is that? If you turn off bipolar cells, what happens is that the amacrine cells also receive bipolar cells. So both these neurons get turned off. So people have not been able to dissociate these two. We have not had a way where we turn off one neuron, but not the other simply because in a network, they are all interlinked to each other. But recent advances has helped us to overcome this. And the advance I'm going to talk about is optogenetics. What is optogenetics? Op so this is a technique where you express a specific channel, a light, light uh, responsive channel in specific subsets of neurons. And what happens when you shine light onto these neurons is although these neurons are in a network, only these neurons which have this channel will get activated. So this way, even, you, even though you have a mesh, you can activate a specific subpopulation in it. So what we did was we expressed this optogenetic tool, the channel rhodopsin, which is the channel that I was talking about, specifically in these starburst neurons. And this is the expression pattern of, this, uh, of the channel rhodopsin in these neurons. So now I'm going to show you one experiment which we performed. So now, under control conditions, when all the circuitry is intact, what we did was we recorded from a ganglion cell and moved bars of light in different directions. And the direction of motion is shown by the arrow here. And the response of the ganglion cell is shown in the bottom. And you can clearly see that this neuron liked movement in the downward direction and did not like movement in the upward direction. Now I told you people have thought or scientists have thought that this is because of inputs from the bipolar cell and the amacrine cell at the level of the ganglion cell. So next what we did was we blocked the bipolar cells. Now classically, if you blo block the bipolar cells, you block the activity of the amacrine cell, so there is no activity at the level of the ganglion cell. Then what we did was we activated just these starburst cells using optogenetics. And now we found that the activity in the ganglion cell is restored and it is in the same direction as it was in control. The neuron prefers movement in the downward direction and does not like movement in the upward direction. And this is a polar plot where each uh, point along the circle indicates a direction in which the object is moving and the point here or the response or the amplitude here indicates how strong the response is. So black shows 
control, which is when all the circuit is intact, and blue shows channel adoption, where only the starburst is intact. And you can clearly see that there is no response in both control and in the optogenetic uh, system at the movement to 90, but there was movement to 70. So this is one cell, and we did this over 14 cells, and on the x-axis, I'm showing the direction under control condition, and y-axis is direction under the channel rhodopsin or the optogenetic condition. And in both cases, the direction coded is the same, and that's why it falls along the straight line. So what this indicated is you don't really need two neurons at the level of the ganglion cell. You just need one neuron, the starburst, to generate direction selectivity. And so what I've shown you today is along with a classic model where people thought you need two neurons, the bipolar cell and the starburst cell at the level of the ganglion cell, we show a second model where the bipolar cell is not needed, but inputs from just the starburst amacrine cell is enough at the level of the ganglion cell to generate direction selectivity. Okay. So this is one tool that I've talked about. Now there are a number of tools that are available and which I have used. Uh, so I have talked to you today about patch clamping and optogenetics. Uh, there are also tools with uh, using like calcium imaging where you can look at the activity of individual neurons and take it further and look at the activity of even say individual dendrites in a neuron. And there are also techniques where we can image the activity of individual neurons by looking at the kind of neurotransmitters they release, say like for example glutamate sensors or acetylcholine sensors. If any of you are interested in talking about these techniques to me, we can definitely discuss it after this session. For, uh, for the interest of time, I'm not going to do, go into detail to any of these sessions, any of these techniques. Okay, so with that, I'd like to thank, I mean, I'd like to finish this section by thanking the people who are uh, responsible for this work, along with me, obviously. Uh, I'd like to thank Malcolm Slaughter, my PhD supervisor, Gautam Autramani, my postdoctoral supervisor, and his lab members, many of the whom have helped along the way uh, in getting these techniques going and in helping me in acquiring data. And of course, collaborators who have provided both uh, expertise and resources without which the work would not have been possible. Okay, so in the next section, I would like to talk about what are the challenges ahead and why do we want to understand how circuits work. So today, I talked to you about just these three neurons, uh, a bipolar cell, the amacrine cell, and the ganglion cell. Now, I told you that all of these neurons are in a mesh and they are interacting with each other. And in reality, the circuit has at least a dozen different types of neurons, uh, each performing its own transformation onto the circuit. We do not understand what are the, why do we need so many inputs and what is the role they perform? So that is a question that needs to be probed, explored. If you take this one step further, this is one circuit. There are 49 other circuits in the mouse retina, each with its own presynaptic circuitry. So the question that comes to mind is how or what is the function of each of the circuit and what kind of transformations are they doing and how, what are the neurons that are presynaptic to them or what connect to them that enable these neurons to perform their specific computation. So the last question with which I want to finish is that why is it important to understand the circuitry? Why is it important to understand whether the direction selectivity in the retina is created by one neuron or by inputs from multiple neurons? The answer lies in the reason why we need to under, it lies in understanding disease mechanisms. So if you look at retinal disorders, visual disorders are largely 
retina based. Uh, what happens under a disease state is you end up with blurry vision and you're not able to do fine scale movements. You're not able to detect, say, under dim light conditions. And in cases, your vision can actually become patchy. Now, this seems like a daunting task to be able to understand how these transformations are happening. The best way to approach this is by looking at the circuitry. Now, I told you there are multiple, there are five main classes of neurons, right? The photoreceptors, the bipolar cells, the ganglion cells, amacrine cells, and horizontal cells. If you look at any disease, they tend to affect specific types of neurons. And if you can pinpoint which of the neurons are affected, then it makes our task a little bit easier in trying to restore the activity of that particular neuron. And that may alleviate the symptoms of the disease. For example, if you look at glaucoma, glaucoma is a disease where the pressure in the eyeball increases, and this results in neuronal death eventually. But this seems to affect, preferentially it affects the off cells. We do not know why yet, but the fact that it, you can make out these differences indicates we can now concentrate on these neurons and try and understand what's happening to them. If you look at nystagmus, infantile nystagmus, what is nystagmus? Nystagmus is the ability where we invariably, if you see an object moving, our eye tends to track it. If your object moves left to right, then your eye tends to track that motion. If it moves in the opposite direction, your eye tends to track that motion. So in this particular disease, people are able to track motion in the horizontal direction, but not in the vertical direction. The eye is just not able to lock on to the object that's moving. And this, we think, happens because of uh, developmental issues in the starburst amacrine cells, a very specific uh, neuronal uh, disease. If you look at retinitis pigmentosa or macular degeneration, we know that they are affected because photoreceptor, these happen because of photoreceptor degeneration. And there's substantial work that's happening uh, trying to restore the activity of the photoreceptors okay? using stem cells, using optogenetics. And there's another example of congenital stationary night blindness where the bipolar cells are specifically affected. It's the connectivity between the bipolar cells and the photoreceptors that are affected. So the point I want to make here is if you can make out, if you can study the disease, and if you understand how these circuits work, then we will be able to understand which circuits are being affected in the disease. Now the disease I want to concentrate on is diabetic retinopathy. It's one of the it's one of the top three, five diseases uh, that lead to vision loss in humans across the globe. But we know very little about what are the kind of uh, neurons that are affected in this particular uh, disease. And so that's one aspect that I will be concentrating on. So to summarize, what I'm interested in is to understand brain function. And the way I will do it is by looking at the circuit computations uh, in the computations performed by circuits in the brain and in the retina. And the hope is that by understanding how things work normally, you can understand what happens to these circuits in disease and perhaps explain how these diseases or the vision compromising the visual disorder or the, diet or the pathology uh, happens. And finally, since we know what are the circuits that are affected, we can design therapies to restore the activity of those circuits and hopefully alleviate the symptoms of the disease. And with that, I'd like to stop and thank all of you uh, for listening and also thank you, thank the, bio, the research club for giving me the opportunity to make this presentation. And I'm ready to take any questions. Okay, so did you guys see anything, hear anything? Hello? 
uh, hey uh, santosh thank you for the wonderful talk um yeah actually so i just have a question for you uh, regarding uh, your investigations i see that the patch clamp studies are really important to understand the circuitry but uh, do you have the infrastructure to do such kind of a studies here at iid say that again uh, uh, i understand that uh, patch clamp studies are really important to understand yeah. the circuitry so right. i i was wondering do we have the infrastructure to do uh, patch clamp studies at iid uh so Professor Amal Bera does some amount of patch clamp work, uh -huh, and uh -huh. I'm hoping to establish another setup for patch clamp. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Just a question. Uh, this will not be more into the experimental side. So. That's totally uh, fine. You you said that there were fifty different types of RGCs, right? Retinal ganglia. uh do their receptive fields also vary okay so that's a so what do you mean by does the receptive fields vary yes so different neurons will have so yeah so if you look at the ganglion cells receptive field it is dependent on how long their dendrites are uh so yes they will be different there are ganglion cells which pick information from a very small field in the mouse you can have ganglion cells at less than 100 microns and there are ganglion cells that go up to 300 400 microns on the so for the uninitiated a receptive field is the region on the retina within which if you shine a light this ganglion cell would respond and so a large receptive field means this ganglion cell can receive inputs from a large space in the retina that is a small receptive field means it cannot receive inputs from wider space thank you uh another doubt so given yeah. that these rgcs can now compute motion as in mm -hmm. they have directional selectivity uh that would basically mean that a given neuron would have to know the position of the input at the previous time instant which would mean that there is a feedback from retinal ganglion cells to retinal ganglion cells uh is that so the the way motion is generated in the in the retina is not by a ganglion cell ganglion cell interaction it's the amacrine cell bipolar cell interaction uh so it's the amacrine cell that uh that is critical Uh, so the ganglion cell see the thing so i think you're thinking from a cortex point of view where the pyramidal cells are all connected to each other yeah uh, yeah i was wondering if the same thing is there and yeah so the retina is more linear so the ganglion cells themselves they don't tend to interact a lot so they form linear circuits and so whatever information they receive from the bipolar cells and the amacrine cells they transmit it to higher centers in the brain and once you reach the cortex then it goes haywire yes they connect uh, laterally and uh, on either direction yeah up and down okay. thank you yeah but i mean to, i did not answer your question uh, perfectly because that will take time we can definitely discuss this over uh, at some other point in time if you if you want we can have a, uh, another session yeah uh yeah so i'm i'm it's not just i mean i was told to expect questions other than science and uh, i'm ready to take uh, questions on that front too if anybody is interested in asking me uh, i have another question actually so uh, yeah. we are we are following this project from epfl the blue brain project and we are looking at the um, i would say some of the patch camp studies and the topological reconstruction of this uh, objects uh, from the studies and we are trying to look at the topological properties of these objects uh -huh. so uh, so basically uh, one of the things that we are trying to achieve is to try to evolve network synthetically uh, but use the rules uh, that uh, let's say neurons would kind of use to kind of um, form the networks so uh -huh. let's say um Uh, one of the things that we would let's say for example 
uh, how would um, let's say a neuron kind of uh, form a link with another neuron let's say what is the, is it uh, more like uh, some kind of, as they say uh, the hebbian rule or something where uh, you neurons that uh, fire together as in wire as in fire together wire together you get a similar stimulus and if they are sim- they say fire together and they wire together or something but that is i would say uh, we are looking for like what are the rules for actually connecting uh, two neurons uh, as in uh, in forming memories is there some kind of evolutionary pressure on them to wire together and what kind of a mathematical structure for uh, wiring what is the criteria when two neurons wire together so yeah so what what you're asking is, so to begin with the retina really doesn't uh, have a lot of plasticity so uh, whatever kind of work i am looking at will have minimal plasticity we, we are thinking of them as hard wired let's say there is some amount of change but it's mostly hard wired uh, to answer your question yes people generally think that neurons which fire together will wire together now again see the biggest problem in all this is and this is true for even the retina now we know there is motion in the retina like motion detection what is it used for how how does the other parts in the brain use this information it's an open question we don't know uh, and so i think this is the other problem to connect perceptual or uh, to connect the experimental level to say a cognition level to form a memory it makes perfect sense to say what do you need to form a memory well you need a neuron two neurons to form a bond uh, you know connect uh, and a long term connection would mean a long term memory uh, now these are clearly assumptions right and this is the problem this is always going to be a problem i think you need, i i think there are studies from what's his name i'm blanking out in colum in colombia uh that's the spanish person, spanish guy anyway so people have shown that if you do a behavior and if you look at the brain you can they you get for that particular behavior a series of neurons get activated now at the end of the day and this can be seen over a repeated sequence now if if you stimulate those neurons uh, does the behavior get replicated and it would seem the answer is yes uh, now how does this actually happen why are these neurons connecting to each other it's still an open question i remember he was saying class they thought it is a classical hebbian uh, uh, synapse the i mean hebbian rule but i think it was more of how the potassium channels in those neurons are regulated so i think to answer your question i don't know what is the mechanism that uh, we are still at a very nascent stage on that front to understand what is the mechanism that makes these neurons wire together i mean yeah i know the cortex synapses are constantly formed and constantly uh, removed yeah we don't have that issue per se in the retina so i have not really uh, followed that literature that well thank you okay so does that mean that yeah uh, yes sir i had like one uh, non science question so you said that you were sure how you got into neuroscience but yeah, yeah. Uh, given that uh, if some of us are sure that neuroscience is what we want to get into uh, what would you advise for us to like get prepared to do research in neuroscience okay so okay, so oh, so i'm it's a going whatever i'm saying okay uh, so one of the biggest problem i faced when i was an undergrad was we really didn't have any neuroscience happening around us whatever information i had was completely uh, based on based on books and uh, so i think the important point is 
make yourself aware of what's happening and where to go and i was telling you that the first time i applied i did not get through and in a sense in hindsight it makes sense because i was unclear on what i wanted to uh, pursue at that point in time it was just neuroscience and that was it so the time i took off and worked at the national brain research center i would say really helped me it helped me formulate for example there are multiple fields right so uh, neuroscience is very broad you can do studies at the level of the molecular level look at proteins that's neuroscience you can look at uh, neuronal activity you can look at behavior cognition you can look at mri so all of this is neuroscience and that gave me a platform or you know gave, gave me a wide idea of what are the things available so if possible i would say you should try to uh, say visit these labs which actually do uh, multiple labs for example center for neuroscience is uh, doing really well uh, ncbs for that matter uh, even in uh, national brain research center all of these places have not one but many neuroscientists so you will be able to get an idea of what are the variety of fields that are there and i would say that really helped me uh, yeah yeah because it's somewhat of a difficult decision because you're young uh, you're also naive at this point in time you don't have the experience and yeah you don't want to get into so if you go to a big school abroad you know the canada is not this way but the us the way it works is you're taken in and then you get a year of rotation where you can sample multiple places and then you may like somebody and then you can join now that system is much better if you go to canada uh, you directly uh, talk to the pi and the pi hires you you may like the work you may not like the work so that's somewhat a more difficult uh, system to uh, work with in which case you need to know beforehand uh, what is the kind of work you like so yeah it is somewhat uh, of a tricky situation uh, do you take that time off and uh, sample you know get an idea of what's happening uh, i mean i think there are summer internships and things like that i don't know if they still have it uh, i don't even know which in uh, organization gives that uh, i mean I, i remember many of my uh, classmates they just mailed uh, pis and uh, they were volunteering in these institutes uh, i remember ncps was a really hot place at that point in time so that really gives you exposure i would say that is the most important thing exposure uh, yeah yeah and I, i mean again you can talk to me uh, at any point in time mail me uh, my mail is it's on the website but it's maybe i should is there a chat box here so that's yes please whoever has raised their hand yeah so i'm ganesh so uh, am i audible I... Yes, so I wanted to ask some uh, a general question about like I am interested in this behavioral neurology, and I'm more interested in this uh, why stress is happening in someone and what kind of chem- neurotransmitter actually works on that. So we actually had a, I mean, I started it recently only, and we formed a team of few people from the batch itself. I wanted to know if you, I mean, some kind of coursework or something kind. Uh, of it can help me in that or i am okay. yeah sorry i did not get the first part so you said there's a group of you and what have you started so okay. not... uh, so okay. we are, we are actually reviewing the work of like how dopamine and uh, cortisol works in motivation and yeah uh, stress in certain people so okay. we are trying to find some ways so that we can reduce that Th- those things in general uh, people who are not having any chronic disorders but just want to uh, like improve motivation or reduce stress or uh, in general 
so okay. we are reviewing some uh, things but uh, the thing is we are not able to actually get through like the really high funda things and we were i was thinking ki it would be really helpful if i get some course done in like in in state itself so i was also curious if you might be taking some course or you are uh, so uh, next semester i'm going to offer a course on biological vision it's going to be more about sensory processing uh, about vision say the auditory system somatosensory system how these uh, centers actually process Uh, the information that uh, hits them uh, it's not going to be at the level of uh, neurotransmitter function or for example neuromodulator function which is what you are uh, referring to at this point yeah. uh, but if you have any issues in understanding some study or some concept we can have a discussion on it i'm more than happy uh, to help you or your friends your group 